All right, welcome back to episode five of the paper. Um, it's been quite a while since we last recorded, but you know, with all this quarantine going on, it's been tough to try to get set up remotely, and we've been finishing up the semester as well. I think we're going to do a quick revisit of our semester or our 2020 goals, um, just to see the progress that we've made so far. Um, I think one of my goals was focused on this semester, um, so hopefully I can give some good progress on that one. Um, Willis, did you want to like quickly review the goals that we set up for 2020? Yeah, so I had that I wanted to grow my portfolio, learn more about the finance industry, get an internship, and read. And then you wanted to finish the semester with a 4.0 and read 10 books in the year. Okay, so I wanted to, uh, my goals for 2020 was to make 100000 start digital. start my digital marketing agency, learn web design and create five websites, um, grow my real estate investing business and purchase my first investing property. And then lastly, complete three running events. And then also I did have one that I didn't include on the first uh, or when we recorded the podcast was to read at least one book each month. So, um, yeah, we can go ahead and review our, our goals and our progress on our goals if you guys want. Yeah, I can start off with that. So um, at least for me, I've, I was able to finish. So it was a little bit of a weird semester. Um a lot of schools, or at least MSU, did a pass-fail like option with a lot of classes, so mm-hmm. I kind of got lucky with that. But um, even so, I was able to get a 3.7, so a little bit off my goal, but still pretty good. Um, I think that raised my GPA, my average overall, so better than I usually get. Um, and I think setting that goal out really helped me to kind of stay focused on it and um, really strive to like get towards that 4.0, which ended up happening pretty well. Um, in terms of like the, the 10 books, I think I'm at five right now. I have it in my notes. So let me check really quick. I had a schedule, eh? Oh, yeah. So I'm at, yeah, five right now. And I'm like progressing through two at the moment. So I like to do for me, like, I like to do one nonfiction, one fiction, because I think when you just read nonfiction, at least, it just gets, like, to the point where it's just, like, all right, I need something to kind of, like, wind down a little bit. That's just me, personally. I'm not sure how you guys found it, but so right now I'm reading a book called The Origin of Wealth, which is about, I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory, <laughs> but kind of how wealth is built and how it's been built over the um the, basically all of human existence and then at the same time I'm reading um, Chronicles of Narnia because it's like a little kid's book so kind of take my mind off other things so kind of cool how about you guys Willis how, how, how have your goals been going so for my portfolio I've probably at least doubled it by now nice I'm investing I think $15 every other week um I'm sort of learning, well, these uh, next two kind of tie in together, learning more about the finance industry and getting an internship. I got an internship. Congrats. congrats. Which is helping me. Thank you. Which (laughs) is helping me learn more about finance. So cool. It's all working together. And then reading, I haven't really done much of that, (laughs) at least not book wise. Like I'll read the paper and stuff, read articles, (laughs) but other than that, not too much. Paper. All right, yeah, so touching on, uh, updating on my goals, my first one to make 100000 Uh I probably am not really too close to that, um, but I'm just uh, graduated last, uh, about two weeks ago, so now I can, you know, focus on increasing my income, not really have to worry about school, class, or anything like that, homework. Congrats, by the way, on graduating. Yeah, appreciate That's you, accomplishment, man. Appreciate you, my brother. <laughs> So, so yeah, so now, um, since, um, I've been done with school and stuff, I've just kind of devoted majority of my time to, uh, my trading education. Um, and then also my next goal, which is starting my digital marketing agency. I have things formed and everything. So, uh, be, uh, on the lookout for the launch. It'll be 
in probably about a week or so. So hopefully, uh, or not hopefully, but with those, with that, and then also um, my increased skill in trading, I do still hope to meet this uh, this goal that I set for the end of the year. So uh, in the next couple of months, we'll be able to look back and provide some more updates on that. So yeah, and then also the starting of the digital marketing agency that's um, almost complete. So I'll have that uh, goal knocked off. Um, and then learning web design and creating five websites. I have one done working on a second. Nice. Um, so that's about 40% of my goal done. Um, honestly, have not really been on my real estate grind like that. But with all my uh, my time now that I have, I'll definitely be um, increasing my uh, workload on that. So like I said, in the next few months, I'll be able to provide a, a better update on that. And then uh, the three running events um, with the coronavirus, I'm sure there's probably really not much running events going on. So yeah. I've, I've been uh, I've been getting back into running on a more consistent basis. And I still have to kind of work on my self-discipline because I don't think there's many people that really look forward to running. I'm sure there are, but. <laughs> I, I'm not one of them, but I, I yeah. do it. I no, do it no. because like, definitely not. <laughs> yeah, but I do it just because like obviously it's it's beneficial. So getting getting back on that grind. Hopefully, when things open back up, I'll be in good enough shape to knock at least one off. And if it even nice. does open up soon, um, and then lastly, my goal of reading a book every month. I definitely have done that. Um, I think last month I was able to do. It was either last month or the month before that I was able to get two done. Um, nice. So, yeah, I've been, especially with this quarantine going on, I've been more of an avid reader, um, trying to just soak in as much information as I can so that I can apply it. Yeah, I would, I would definitely second that as well. I've been reading a lot more because, like, there's literally nothing to do. Right. <laughs> but, yeah, so, yeah, those are, uh, those are the updates on my goals. In a couple of months, we can definitely uh, – look back on this progress update and hopefully there's even more progress will quadruple his portfolio and <laughs> costas knocks out yeah, his, his 10 books and but yeah For so sure. all right cool so <clears throat> hopefully you guys enjoyed that little update on our goals definitely like tc mentioned we'll do another progress update in a in a couple months here um today's topic in the finance section is going to be uh financial statements so over the next couple of weeks, hopefully um, we get into a more consistent recording schedule and I'll be able to take you guys through what I, I'm going to call the financial statement series. So um, with today's episode, I'm just going to lay out basically basically some basics um, of the financial statements, um, just basically what they are, what they're used for, some different um, things to look for, and then a def def few definitions. Um, but before I do that, let me give you a quick market update. So we're recording this on Sunday, uh, May May 17th. So the market closed on Friday at 23,000. The Dow closed at 23,000, about 600. And the S&P was at 2,800. Um, so, yeah, everything's kind of been, the markets have been pretty depressed over the coronavirus. And there's a lot of uncertainty. So, of course, when you have uncertainty in the market, Investors will just pour money into um, different, more safe assets like treasury bills and take them out of stock. So um, just be on the lookout gold. for that. Stay stay tuned into, yeah, gold for sure. Um, and then stay tuned into like your news, um, obviously like Wall Street Journal and different news outlets like that for more updates on that. So jumping into today's topic, um, financial statements. So essentially what financial statements are, um, every public company must file them. Um, with the SEC. Uh, they consist of the income statement, the balance sheet, the cash flow statement, and then sometimes you also see a statement of stockholders equity, um, which I'm not going to touch on today, but you can definitely do your own research into that. And it's important to also say, um, obviously, we're all <laughs> like two college students and one very recently graduated college student. So none of this should be construed as investment advice. And also, also always do your own um, research and due diligence before you make any investment decisions and consult a financial planner if you see that to be, or if you feel that's something that you should do before you make any decisions. 
So moving on, um, like I said, every publicly traded company must can um, must file these with the SEC, and then they also will sometimes have just investor investor relations section on their website where they post the statements as well. So you can get them from two different um, sources there. Um, the, the statements must be in line with what's called GAAP um, or what's referred to as GAAP. It's called the Generally Accepted Accounting Principles, so GAAP. Um, and then if they're an international company, so they operate in different, um, many different countries, they have to be in line with IFRS, which is International fi Financial Reporting Standards. Um, and what that does is first it provides companies um, or investors rather with um, what's called economic reality. So it makes sure everything's in line there and they're obviously being truthful. And then it also provides a way for investors to evaluate different companies and have a standardized way of looking at each company. So obviously when you make a comparison, you want things to be, you know, uniform across the board. And that's what Gap and IFRS does. Kind of touched on this already, but they're used by investors analysts and regulators so what the difference between an investor and an analyst each stock will usually have like two or th maybe two or three analysts some of the bigger companies will have like upwards of 10 um, that focus just on that company and how that company is doing and then they make recommendations to the public um, like professional recommendations because these people most of the time know what they're talking about um, and that way you can kind of get a better view of, of what the company's doing yeah um th they also um you can also use them to evaluate a company's financial health that's basically the main point of them and then their earnings potential going forward so th if i recall correctly this is all and I, i'm sure you probably already said it but this is like all public information that Yep. an investor can go out and find on their own and be able to kind of make their own decision on if a company is worth investing in right yeah this is like i said um it's they publish them with the sec so mm -hmm. if you just type in sec.gov um, and you go into like the filing section and then you just look up 10k so uh, that's actually brings up a good point i should mention that um, the statements will be filed as a 10K if it's yearly, and it's 10Q, I believe, as quarterly. So look for those designations in terms of, like, um, how the statements are filed. So if you, you could just also look up, like, say I want to look at Apple. I just type in Apple 10K, mm -hmm. and it's going to pop up right there. I mean, Google is very powerful. So, oh, yeah. But, yeah, they, they all of this is public information. Like I said, every public company must file them. Otherwise they're breaking the law um but however private companies don't have to file them so you have to make sure that the company you you're looking at is is indeed publicly traded okay. so great question though for sure um so then let's jump into the balance sheet so important point here is to make sure to say that the balance sheet is referred to as what's called a snapshot um, and meaning that it's on a set date and not a range of like a quarter or a year. Um, usually it's the end of a fiscal year or maybe the end of a quarter that companies will file these. I mentioned this before, but it's just on a date. So it's not over a range. So in, like it wouldn't be from, say, uh, the beginning of Q1 all the way up until uh, Q2 that there's a different statement for that. Right. Yeah. So that's the income statement covers a range. Again, great question. But so the balance sheet will say something like assets um, as of December 31st, 2020. Okay. So then that's just going to tell me on that date, mm. those are what the assets was, not assets were, not how they've changed okay. over time. That you'll have to look at like the cash flow statement and the income statement, which we'll get into later. Okay. But again, great, great question there. Um, for a uh, fiscal year, is it different for every company? Yeah, that's what, yeah, great question. And how is it? <laughs> create like when does it start yeah so like a fiscal year is just whatever the company um sets as like fiscal year day one and then obviously like 365 days later there'll be fiscal year two so but it doesn't necessarily have to be like december 31st or june 30th or anything they can put the fiscal year whatever day they want so that's an important thing to look at make sure that when you're looking at these statements 
you know what the date is, what the range of the date is for like income statement and cash flow statement. Um, but yeah, they don't necessarily have to be on like not every company has to be have the same f- fiscal year. Great question so right. far. Um, all right, so assets equals liabilities plus equity. That's the basic um, balance sheet equation. Um, what this does is tell you kind of how assets are funded, um, either with debt, which would be liabilities, or with equity, which is stockholders' equity, or sometimes it's referred to as owners' equity. So the asset section, it's broken out into current assets and long-term assets. Current assets are anything that kind of has an expiration or can be liquidated within the year. Um, so this would be cash and cash equivalents, would be, which would be like cash on hand, um, treasury bills, which are super liquid, and you can sell them quickly and get cash in exchange. Um, certificates of deposit, obviously, again, very liquid. And then I keep saying this word, but li- other liquid secur- securities. So what I mean by liquid is I can sell that asset super quickly and without a huge loss in value. So like, for example, <clears throat> um, you can sell stocks almost immediately. Like you just go on your brokerage website and sell them. You can get cash in exchange. Now, if I want to sell my house, well, I mean, I'm going to have to list it. I got to get offers on it. It's going to take a long time. Sometimes I might have to knock a little bit off the listing price. So there's that loss of value that I mentioned. Um, but it's just not the same with stocks. You can sell them immediately and you can get 99.999% of their value for them. Um, another current asset would be accounts receivable. So this is money owed to the company from exchange uh, or in exchange for services rendered. That's like the technical definition. But what that means is I go out, I perform the service for a customer and they haven't given me the cash yet for it. Um, another current asset would be inventory. So pretty self-explanatory. It's just items waiting to be sold. If you're a goods company, um, service companies won't have as much inventory, but they might have a few objects in that category. Um, and then the long-term assets, that's just things like property, plant, and equipment, pp and it's sometimes referred to as. Those are things like factories, machines. Again, these are things that aren't very liquid. They take a long time to sell, and you might have to knock the price down a little bit. Yeah. Um, so jumping into the liability section, again, broken out into current and long-term. Current as any debt that are, is due within the year. So this would be like accounts payable or something like that. Long term is pretty much everything else. So anything that's due longer than a year from now. Um, some some examples of liabilities would be like I said, accounts payable, dividends payable, notes payable, which could be long term, and then also wages payable. So you'll see that all of those things have the word payable in them. So. Whenever you see the word payable, just think, okay, that's a liability. So that's something that the company needs to either pay, that needs to pay out eventually. So that was pretty quick. So let's jump into equity now. So like I said, this is sometimes referred to as owners or stockholders equity. Um, it's basically whatever is left um, after the liabilities have been subtracted from the assets. So this would be money returned to the shareholders if the assets were sold and then all the debt was paid off. Um, A big part of equity would be retained earnings. So this is the amount of net earnings that were not paid out. So therefore retained Mm -hmm. um, and they were not paid out to shareholders. So the formula there is the beginning retained earnings balance. So you can find that on the basically the balance sheet from one year prior. You add in the net income, and then you subtract out any dividends paid out, and then you'll get ending retained earnings. So, like I said, the dividends, if the div- if there's more dividends paid out, that means that ending retained earnings is going to be a lot smaller, right? Because that's subtracting. Um, if there weren't so many, so much dividend paid out, it's going to be smaller. There'll be more retained earnings. Um, so, something that you see a lot with companies is this kind of battle between um management the management of the company and the owners or the shareholders um obviously management wants to keep as much cash as they can um to have more opportunities to like reinvest it buy more factories get into new markets different things like that yeah. whereas the owners obviously want that money in their pocket they want it paid out as dividends so there's a rule of thumb 
where if the management cannot reinvest the money at a higher rate than I can just get in the market just by investing in other stocks, so about 6 7 8%, anywhere in there, if they're not making more than that, say they're reinvesting the money into the business at 5%, they're only getting 5% of the money, they should pay out that money to, to shareholders so that they can do what they want with it. And sometimes what you'll see is like activist investors will – so big time investors like hedge funds or mutual funds will take a big stake in a company that's hoarding cash and they'll make them pay it out to shareholders. So like Apple had this a couple of years ago, they were hoarding a bunch of cash because they want to keep it and reinvest it. And an activist investor took a big stake in the business and, and told them, hey, you know, pay that cash out. Mm. Okay. Um, so that pretty much concludes the balance sheet. So next we'll cover the income statement. Um, so touching on this, like I said, it, the income statement covers a range. So this is going to tell me how um, things have changed over the quarter or the year. Um, it's kind of the inverse of the balance sheet. It's not a set date. Um, so at the top of the income statement, it might say something like um, for the period ended December 31st, similar to the balance sheet, but that means either the quarter ended that that date or the year ended. Um, the basic formula here is revenues minus expenses equals net income. Um, that then gets broken down into revenue minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit, and then gross profit minus operating expenses equals net income, or sometimes referred to as EBIT, E-B-I-T. And then NOI, or EBIT minus other expenses equals net income. So there's different ways to break it down and then look at different um, ratios, which we'll cover in a future episode. All right. Oh, and it's also important to say that net sales is basically the same as revenue. So net sales is just saying like revenue minus cost of goods. Sold. Like, you know, that, that would be gross profit, okay. but net sales is like um, revenue minus sales discounts so like that'd be saying like if i sell a hundred dollar item and i give somebody a 10 percent discount my revenue is a hundred percent or a hundred dollars sorry but i gave that 10 percent dif- discount so i can only mark i can only book 90 dollars right. of revenue okay but when you see net sales just think revenue same thing um g- getting into types of expenses now the cost of goods sold um is pretty self-explanatory it's just the cost of the materials or the labor directly used to create the good or service. So as you can probably imagine, service companies won't have as high of a cost of goods sold. It's kind of implies it in the name. They don't have goods that they're selling. So like for a real world example, um, I recently worked for a company called TechSmith, um, which sells software. And obviously there's no physical good with software. You're just selling like the license. So their gross, our gross profit was really, really high. Mm. Um, you wouldn't see that in something like um, a grocery store or something like that that sells a physical good because they actually have cost of goods sold. Okay, that makes sense. Right. Um, but then again, service companies will have a lot higher, or at least they will have in operating expenses, that's going to take a lot of that re- revenue off, you know, in terms of like subtracting from the revenue. Mm-hmm. Um, again, the value of the cost of goods sold can change based on the accounting standards used. So that's why we have GAP and we have IFRS to make sure that everybody's doing it the same way so that we can make good comparisons, which we'll cover again in a future episode of comparing companies and things like that. Um, operating expenses are just the indirect expenses of running the business. So that'd be things like rent on factories or office buildings, utilities, um, employee salaries or other employee expenses like traveling, things like that. So basically anything that's not related to the good mm-hmm. or the, ser- yeah, good. This is sometimes referred to as SGNA. So when you see that SGNA, just think operating expenses. Um, so then I wanted to make a quick distinction here um, in terms of like EBIT versus EBITDA. So when you see EBIT, that stands for Earnings before interest and tax, E-B-I-T. And then EBITDA is E-B-I-T-D-A. So that's earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. So we talked about this a little bit in our kind of prep, but 
as you go down the income statement, so if you're looking at income statement, you're reading down. So obviously top line will be revenue. Then it'll list out the expenses. As you go down, you, you start to lose letters off of the EBIT and EBITDA. So like earnings before interest and ta interest tax depreciation and amortization, that's going to be higher up on the income statement than EBIT is because EBIT is just earnings before interest and tax. So kind of something to help you visualize what an income statement looks like. Obviously, you can just go, like we said, on Google and, and look at one and kind of get a real visualization. But just think as you go down the income statement, you're going to lose letters off of the end of that. And then inco income tax and interest expense are listed as other expenses. Those are be towards the bottom of the income statement. All right. So last but certainly not least, we've got the cash flow statement. Um, essentially, this, this statement answers the question, how well does the company generate cash? So it's broken out into three sections. The first being the cash flow from operations. Next would be the cash flow from in investing activities. And then third is cash flow from financing activities. So with cash flow from operations or operating cash flow or cash flow from operating activities, all the same thing. Um, this show this number kind of shows how does the company generate cash through its operations. So if I'm a grocery store, my operations are selling groceries. If I'm like Apple, my operations are selling iPhones, selling iPads, um, selling like Apple software, things like that. If I'm like a computer store, my operations are selling computers. Like you, you kind of get yeah. the gist of that. It's not, it's what the business is meant to do. So, so is cash flow um, net income or is it just how the cash is flowing in? Is that like really yeah. what the cash flow statement does? Yeah, that's a good distinction to make. So net income and cash flow from operations are not the same thing. So net income is the accrual method of accounting and cash flow from operations takes the accrual method and puts it back into, or not back into, but transfers it over to the cash um, basis of accounting. So those two things you can look up on your own. Um, for our listeners, you can do your own research into that because that's an important distinction. That's not really the point of the episode, but that's a great question in terms of like, Cash flow from operations and net income are not the same. So mm -hmm. don't think of them that way. Um, the, the, so I'll kind of touch on that in this next part here. So the formula for cash flow from operations would be net income. You add back depreciation and amortization because that's considered a non-cash expense. So cash has not left the business and yet I still have an expense there. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to add in the change in receivables the change in liabilities, the change in inventory, and the change in expenses and revenue. So an, an easy way to think about this is if I'm the company, has cash left my business or have I gained cash? So for example, with a receivable, I am able to book that revenue because I've, I've render, rendered the service mm -hmm. and yet I still have no cash. So I need to take net income and I need to subtract a a gain in receivables, if that makes sense. So my revenue number has gone up because I got that revenue because I did the service, but I got no cash for that. So I need to subtract the, the um, gain in receivables from the revenue so that it's stated in cash um, basis of accounting. The opposite is true for any liabilities. So for example, um, I have revenue. I, somebody did a service for me or sold me some stuff. I didn't give them any cash, but I booked that expense. So I have to add to net income the, the gain in liabilities because expense was booked and no cash went out. So I still have that cash. Mm -hmm. So like I said, just think of has cash left the business or has cash come back into the business? Okay. And that'll be able to, that'll um, kind of give you a good picture on um, the cash flow from operations. Okay. So other things we want to say about cash flow from operations, um, mature companies have um, high cash flow from operations because they're just doing business all the time. So Apple will have a higher 
cash flow from operations than like Uber. And I think Uber has negative anyways, um, cause they're losing money. But anyways, um, it affects their liquidity because again, they're, they're, um, bringing in that cash. They've got more cash to say pay bills or for example, the coronavirus, um, they're kind of using that cash to pay out their bills, even though they're not generating any business. Um, more cash means more opportunities and a better financial position. So more, um, if you have more cash, you can invest it, like I said, back into the business. You can go into new markets. You can try a new product line, different things like that. Okay. So we're kind of running short on time here, but let me just jump through these last two pretty quickly. Um, the cash flow from investing activities, um, that's things like um, selling or buying assets, selling or buying other companies like mergers and acquisitions, different things like that. Um, and the formula here is the capital expenditures. So the purchase or sale of equipment or a fixed assets, you add in either the purchase, purchase or sale of other businesses. So again, if I purchase a business, cash is going out. If I sell a business, cash is coming in. Mm-hmm. So that's the, either the positive or the negative there. And then also the add in the purchase and sale of securities. So again, purchase cash going out, sale cash coming in and this is like buying um, stocks in the market um negative cash flow from investing is not necessarily bad that just means that companies are spending more cash to either invest in fixed assets or they're buying other businesses they're merging with businesses different things like that young you'll see that this is very common in young companies so like for example uber they're going to have a large a large negative so kind of a oxymoron there but a large negative cash flow from investing activities because they're trying to get started you know they're trying to get into new markets different things like that um what you don't want to see though is a high cash flow from investing with little to no cash flow from operations so this means that companies are trying to like inflate their cash flow statement by just selling assets and not generating any business so their cash flow from operation or cash flow from operations will be very small with a high cash flow from investing. Um, cash flow from financing activities, you'll see this is very similar to investing. This is this tells me how much money is coming into the business from investors. So, formula here is the the issue or repurchase of equity, add in the issue or repurchase of debt, and then add in dividend payments or anything other items like interest payments. So. Um, when I issue stock or issue debt, money's coming in, so that would be a positive. If I repurchase equity, and I don't believe you can repurchase debt, I uh, need probably do your own research into that. But essentially, repurchasing equity in the market—that's money, that's cash leaving the business. Um, same kind of like points that I made about cash flow from investing it are, can be made with financing. You don't want to see a high financing cash flow with a low cash flow from operations. That means the companies just keep asking investors for money with, and they're just burning through it. They're not putting it to work in, in their operations or anything like that. Um, you'll see it a lot with young companies. They'll have large cash flow from financing and not large, or sorry, just large cash flow from financing. Um, and then, yeah, I think that about wraps it up. So hopefully you guys learned something about cash flow statements and income statements and balance sheets. Um, and you'll be able to better understand them when you look at companies. Um, like I said, I'm going to continue the series with kind of like different ratios and um, comparisons of companies, and maybe we'll like go through and evaluate a company um, in the future, but hopefully this gave you kind of a baseline. Yeah, for sure. All right, so for this episode, I'm going to be looking at Desmond Ferguson. He is a local guy from Lansing. He went to the University of Detroit Mercy. He played basketball there. He then went on to become a NBA player. He played for the Portland Trailblazers and ended up retiring in 2001. After that, he went on to go coach at his alma mater, Everett High School, until 2017 to solely focus on his company, Moneyball. And while he was the coach at Everett, they made some good runs in the state playoffs. Yeah, me and TC played against them a couple of times. They were some pretty good teams for sure. 
<laughs> so his company, Moneyball, it was created in 2002. They are primarily a, I'd say, clothing company. Or that's how they started off, at least. They were making unique uniforms that they weren't just for basketball. They were for all sports. They have teams like Lansing United, a soccer team. They have football and soccer teams, and it's all over the country and in other countries. Two of the bigger names that they have uniforms with are the National Basketball Academy for Canada and the Nigeria National Basketball Team. Found that pretty cool how they're getting all the way yeah. to Nigeria. Yeah. Just from Lansing, too. Very cool. Um, so, Willis, did they so – the uni- I know you mentioned that they make uniforms. Did, is that something that they started off with, or were they more like – um, other sports wear apparel and then they kind of branched out into uniforms or was it the opposite? It was more of the opposite. They started off with the uniforms okay. and then moved or expanded into just a clothing brand, right. I guess. Because okay. they have sweatpants, t-shirts, jackets, mm-hmm. and they're even moving into face masks now <laughs> how the environment is today. So the uniforms, they have, um, they're not like just colors or fonts. You can make them unique to your team and customize them. They got hundreds of different teams, all sports. They had this year at the All-Star Weekend in Chicago, they had a pop-up shop there. So they're really going everywhere. They're working with the NBA, it sounds like. Um, They also continued with the company and the basketball. They're doing tournaments. They have the Moneyball Tip-Off Classic, the Moneyball Pro-Am. That's a pretty big one with college players. Uh, they got players like Cassius Yeah, Winston they have, in. they usually have a lot of uh, local or like big names uh, from the college, uh, local college scene. Like um, I remember Miles Bridges was in there. Draymond Green played a few games. Denzel Valentine. Just a lot of Tom yeah. Tom <laughs> Tom Nair was out there splashing threes. Um, but yeah, a lot of like uh, um, college players and former pros. Um, and then also there's some uh, recent high school graduates that uh, that play uh, from from, from yeah. Lansing that play in it. Yeah, it's really cool. They have it. Um, they used to have it. I remember going over to I think it was at Pango a couple times. Mm-hmm. I went there and watched a couple games, and then now they've kind of gone into um, Aim High, which is like kind of the local recreation center, I guess you could call it. It's just that they just got a bunch of basketball courts, and you can just so now they run all the games over there, and yeah, they're pretty cool. So they're all in Lansing, yeah. right? Yeah, I think so, right? What so was so? that? The games? They're all in, yeah, yeah. They're all in Lansing. Yeah, they all play at yeah. Aim High. Uh, they're usually, I think, at the beginning of the summer. Until I think like until the end of July, I'm not exactly sure on the length of the season, but yeah, they're all at they play all the games at Aim High, I believe, every Tuesday and Thursday. Right, yeah, it's pretty sweet. I would definitely recommend if you're like in the area or during that time. I mean, obviously during normal times, not now, but if you can like go over and watch the games, they're pretty cool. Mm -hmm. They're pretty lit. Very, especially when Miles Bridges was there, he was uh. Going crazy on Ball is Life, all those oh, yeah. other like the hoop mixtapes. Yeah, are. yeah, it's been really cool to see like how it's grown over like the years. Like I said, I I went and watched a game when I was a little bit younger at Pat and Gill, which is like a middle school, and now they like basically take over Aim High for the whole month yeah. of like months of June and July, like you for said. Sure. So it's pretty sweet. Yeah, so that really started in 2004, but would you say it's really now starting to take off? Yeah, I think it's, I think um, it's starting to gain the um, a good level of, like, awareness more nationally, especially since bigger-time names are starting to play in it a little bit more. Yeah. Um, it's definitely one of the, um, the best uh, pro-ams in the er- area for sure. Yeah, I mean, especially with, like, 
I think the Michigan State players have really helped it to grow, especially like obviously we mentioned Miles Bridges. He's an NBA player, and he just won like what rookie? No, not rookie of the year, but like he was in the All Star game. He was, he I think he won MVP in the All Star game. So the rising star, yeah. like a rising star. Yeah, sorry, um, but like I think the adding in those Michigan State players really helped it to grow like you said, nationally, and, like, it's getting, like, Ball's life has been there. It's getting some real, like, pull nationally. So, yeah, I'd definitely say it's, like, it's really starting to take off. Yeah. So, Desmond himself, he has a basketball clinic along with those tournaments. Obviously, I haven't <laughs> been to them. Have you guys no, gone to them? No, I haven't went, but I've always uh, seen, like, people with the – they have a shirt that says the Dem- Desmond Ferguson Basketball Clinic. So, I, I've known of it, but I never went. Yeah, I, I didn't go there either. All right. Uh, their mo- Moneyball's motto is, grow with us, Moneyball, the only way oh, to yeah. ball. Only Straight way cool. to ball. Straight to the point, Yeah. <laughs> So now we're moving on to how they grew. They started off just a small local sportswear company. Now they're one of the world's largest local sportswear and custom team apparel merchants. They sell the schools, clubs, and for Michigan, the Boys and Girls Club. So pretty all around. Anyone can get a jersey or Yeah, it's good to clothes. see them start partnering with, um, like, um, like larger organizations, like the, um, like you said, the national uh, or the United States uh, basketball in Canada and the Nigerian national team, and even locally they have they sponsor the uh, Lansing United. So to see them go from like just like high school yeah. teams to like bigger organizations, I think that will uh, help them in the future, just to you know create more awareness on a on a grander scale. Yeah, for sure. Yep. He, Desmond, realized that there wasn't a basketball program in Lansing like there was in Detroit or Flint, they, where they got pretty good basketball programs, I feel like. You got, like, Miles Bridges out of Flint, Cassius out of Detroit, yeah. and now Lansing, they're kind of growing it more. with. Yeah, Moneyball. I think... Moneyball's done really um, well to uh, kind of, like you said, increase the basketball, the high school basketball scene in Lansing. Like, I mean, obviously, like, you, there's big time players coming out of Detroit all the time, like you mentioned in Flint. But even like, I mean, for an example, like Denzel Valentine came out of Lansing as well as like Bryn Forbes, and they actually played on the same team. But yeah, but like you said, the Moneyball kind of like. Um, accents the the talent in Lansing, so pretty cool and cool that you mentioned that as well. Yeah, so they actually have a few stores that you can visit, not currently, <laughs> but you when this is over, possibly they got one in the uh, Meridian Mall in Okemos. They have one on Waverly Road. And then they also have one in Southfield right outside of Detroit. Nice. So they're expanding, which is good for them. They, one of them, pretty much their major impact, which we've kind of been touching on the entire time, he's helped grow the basketball program in Lansing. He's helped college, continue, college players continue to play in their off season and step up their game in the program. And then one of Desmond's quotes was, Lansing has always been home and always will be home. So he's going to keep investing in the Lansing, it sounds like, and making it better. Nice. Love to see that. For sure. So, it's definitely uh, cool to see, like, and to highlight um, local entrepreneurs that are, um, you know, making a, a large impact, not even just locally, but, you know, branching out and having – and leaving their footprint on um, a more national scale. Because, like, ever since I've even been introduced to Moneyball, since then it's really grown exponentially. And I, I see it, like, a lot of places um, outside of just Lansing and even the state of Michigan. It's traveled to Nigeria, which is something I just learned. 
Um, so yeah, it's it's really awesome to see somebody from Lansing kind of uh, just growing something to a much larger scale. Yeah, I think touching on that as well, um, e- even though he's grown it to a, lo- a huge, like, I mean, obviously now it's international, mm-hmm. like he still um, holds that belief that Lansing, like you said, is always, will always yeah. be home. And he's still like, still grounded here in Lansing, which is cool. Cause, like you don't like, it's awesome that he's grown his business, but you'd hate to see like if somebody grew to that stage and then kind of like got away from their mm-hmm. roots, which it doesn't seem like he's done at all. Like, Will said he's been investing in Lansing and putting on that program is pretty cool. And then obviously that quote just kind of drives that home, that point of him remembering his roots, which is awesome. Absolutely. So that wraps up our entrepreneur session for this episode. We're going to send it over to TC. All right, so wrapping up this episode, uh, like we do with every episode up until now, we are going to touch on wellness. Um, And this episode will be focused uh, primarily on your mental wellness, um, given that uh, May is Mental Health Month or Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, Mental Health Awareness Month has been observed in May. Uh, ever since 1949, so about 70 years, um, this has been a thing. Um, so before we uh, touch on uh, the content of this segment, um, I think it's good to clarify what mental health is. Um, a lot of people hear uh, the buzzword of mental health, but um, but may not really understand exactly what that encompasses. So through my research, this is the best definition that I was able to come up with. Um, mental health includes our emotional, emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act. It shapes how we perceive the world, make decisions. Um, this is very important to investing and how to handle stress when it comes our way, which is also very important when it comes to investing. So really this segment of the pod um, is really important because we can teach as much information about investing, but if you yourself, like your mental, your mindset isn't intact, then it'll be pretty hard to apply the concepts that we cover. So this is just kind of like some backstory into like why this segment of the uh, podcast is important. Um, So... Why mental health, my, why mental wellness is important is, like I touched on in the definition, is it shapes how we perceive the world. Um, so given how we feel and how we act and the thoughts that we think, our, the way our perspective on how we view the world is going to be um, tailored to the thoughts, like the thoughts that we think. So if our, our mental uh, health state is in a, in a negative state, then the thoughts that we think, then the way we see the world will also be viewed through like a negative lens and vice versa. If you have, if you're in a positive mental health state, then you will have positive thoughts, feel positive feelings, and then you'll ultimately be in a positive uh, state of being, which we'll kind of cover um, a little bit more. So um, another reason why this is important is because Thoughts are energy, and um, so if you have thoughts that are not of a positive, you know, um, positive, positive end of the spectrum, then you're creating uh, a negative energy. And if you have positive thoughts, then you're creating a positive energy. So, for instance, say if you're experiencing suffering or if you're experiencing um, depression then you're going to be thinking thoughts um, like that and you'll start thinking and you'll start feeling that way, which will perpetuate itself. And um, so this is called a self-fulfilling prophecy. So say that you have all of these negative feelings of like depression and all that, then it's, it's going to be hard to kind of get out of that um, feeling because you've created a state of being. Mm. Um, because thoughts, um, are attached to your mind and feelings are connected to your body. So when they are in unison, 
it, that creates the state of being. So say you have you feel you don't feel well, you feel kind of down, and then you start thinking of thoughts that kind of perpetuate that. You un, you unconsciously just created a state of being. Mm. Um, but if we if we if we use this logic and flip it on its head, and you start thinking um, th- positive thoughts, you and then you start feeling uh, feelings of gratitude, happiness, and joy. Um, you can you can flip that by and create a positive state of being. Um, and mental mental wellness it goes hand in hand with physical wellness. Um, when you eat well, get enough sleep, stay active. Um, your your emotional state, your mental health state can improve. Um, and then the opposite is also true. When you don't get adequate sleep, you don't exercise, and you eat lots of junk food, your mental uh, health can, can suffer greatly from that. So um, with all this information, it's, it's kind of a, it's good to know, but it's useless if I don't touch on how to improve your state of mental health. Mm-hmm. So... I think number one is to get enough sleep. I think sleep is imperative to our optimal functioning just as humans. Mm -hmm. Um, A a lack of sleep can make us cranky and more susceptible to stress, and which is very important to your mental health because I think a lot of people are, there's a lot of things that can cause stress. So um, being able to kind of mitigate and manage that that stress is key to preserving your mental wellness. And that's something that I'll touch on in another episode and be able to really deep dive into that. So stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm. Um, Another tip would to be, would be to avoid sugary foods, um, greasy foods, salts, processed foods, and saturated fats. And we touched on this in our last episode, just on the importance of having a healthy diet. So you can kind of see now that we've kind of, focused on the mental wellness, um, how that still kind of correlates, how they go hand in hand. Um, So for sugars, sugars, for instance, uh, the roller coaster of high blood sugar followed by a crash may accentuate the symptoms of mood disorders. Um, Research has tied heavy sugar consumption to an increased risk of depression. And I can just kind of insert my own personal experience in this. before I really started watching what I was eating and really monitoring the types of food I was taking in, I was eating a lot of fast food. I was eating a lot of junk food. Mm. So obviously like sugars and processed foods. And I definitely felt um, the effects of that type of food mentally. Like I, I was probably like the worst mental state I had been in. I wasn't working out. I wasn't doing all of that. So mm-hmm. yeah, I'm kind of like a from my own experience, I really understand how all this um, things are important to your mental health and how it all kind of correlates and coincides. So, um, and not, and cutting out all this stuff is good, but what is going to do you uh, one better is replacing it with more beneficial things, stuff like whole grains, greens, unprocessed foods, lean meats, not really fatty meats, um, and unsaturated fats. Um, and then to make sure you're eating two to three well-balanced meals per day. Um, and uh, you can kind of do your own research as to what type of nutrition you would like to uh, fill your body with to make sure they're well-balanced. Um, and then also a key is to drink three liters of water per day. Um, as humans, we're made up of mostly water. So we want to make sure that our body is is getting that um threshold that we need so drinking enough water keeps our brain from having to struggle against the effects of dehydration and yeah i think like, if i could just jump in real quick like go ahead, go ahead. A, um, that's a great way to simultaneously like cut out like you said sugar high sugar food so or drinks in this case so like i mean obviously not now because of corona but when you're at the re- when you're at a restaurant and the waiter asks you like what do you want to drink just saying water will mm-hmm. at, at both at, at the same time cover cutting out sugary drinks and getting you to that three liters of water per day. So I yes. found that that's a good way to do that. And then sometimes what I'll do is like me personally, when I feel like I'm hungry and I want to grab like a quick snack or something, um, which would probably end up being like chips or whatever, I'll just fill up a glass of water, drink it real quick. And then that kind of like holds me over or 
um, takes the place of eating something that's probably not good for me. So I've been doing that recently and that's really kind of helped me um, feel a little bit healthier. So that's awesome, bro. Yeah. It's good yeah. to see these, these small like habits. Cause that's, that's how, what I used to do when the waitress came, I would always get like a pink lemonade or some yeah, Coke right. or something. But yeah. ever, like, I've been just drinking a lot more water and I just, I've cut out pop and, and juice like that all together. And I, I definitely have seen the effects uh, cog- cognitively and just because, like I said, it's like a roller coaster um, that drinking or intake of sugar creates is up and down, up and down. Right. Um, and, and that's not really good because it, it that affects your the mood that you're in. If right. you're if you're on a um, a sugar high, then you're gonna feel a certain way. And then if you like when you crash from that, you're gonna be feeling all down and. And that's kind of where the depression kind of kicks in. Right. So, yeah. That's so, all we agree. so staying away from that, making, like Costa said, uh, replacing any uh, um, sugary drinks with water um, will be definitely beneficial to you in the long run. So um, last couple of keys um, to improving your mental wellness is to stay away from toxic thoughts, toxic people, and toxic conversations. So I'm sure everybody that's listening can, you know, relate to this. They've had toxic people in their life, toxic conversations that they've held, and even toxic thoughts. And like I said at the beginning of this um, segment, uh, thoughts are energy. So when you're thinking toxic thoughts, you're creating toxic energy, which will affect you. Um, And we'll kind of cover, um, like, the, the inner workings of this on a later episode. Um, just don't want to overwhelm anybody with, you know, too deep of a deep dive into the rabbit hole. But um, just, yeah, just take that surface value. Stay away from toxic thoughts, toxic people, and toxic conversations. And kind of like the um, the example I had of removing all the negative uh, nutrition things, You it that's good, but it'll do you one better to replace it with positivity. So engage in positive thoughts and conversations. Think positive thoughts. Um I think a lot of people are hard on themselves. So that kind of perpetuates um, if you're going through um, a bad bout with mental um, health issues, uh, people can kind of think negative thoughts about themselves. Right. And that doesn't, that doesn't really help. So if you start engaging in positive thoughts and conversations, that will definitely be extremely beneficial to lift your spirits and help get you out of whatever rut you're in. Um, and then lastly, uh, this is something I practice um, heavy, um, or not lastly, there's one more thing after this, um, engaging in physical activity at least uh, 30 minutes a day. Um, and this is extremely important because say you're stressed out or you're you're down or whatever, going to get a little workout in or going on a run or even going on a walk um, can definitely help clear your mind of whatever it is that's, you know, hindering you at that moment and really kind of get you out of that that negative space that those negative vibes and just you know create um a better feeling and when you when you're working out you feel a lot better about yourself because you did something that's going to help you you did something that you you invested in yourself to um work on your your physical health which i also said um will tie into your your mental health yeah so then um, I, I can also like kind of personally attest to this, like, um, especially now, this is a great time. If you're not, you don't necessarily have to be like an avid, you know, gym goer or anything like that. Um, mm-hmm. but with the quarantine, there isn't like really sh- honestly shit to do. So like, if you're feeling bored or you're laying around the house or you're like, you just got done with a, a zoom meeting or something like that, just hitting a quick walk around the block or, um, maybe if you want to do something more serious, you could do like some push-ups or some sit-ups or something. Just mm-hmm. anything to kind of like get your body moving, trying to fight against like that that stir craziness of the quarantine. Um, that's definitely going to help you out. And I've kind of personally done this because um, I'm kind of just chilling at home all day. So um, what I like to do is just wake up kind of earlier in the morning and get a quick workout in um, and then in addition to like feeling better throughout the day, um, physically and mentally, um, it kind of gives me what I like to call like a momentum. And I think, 
Mm-hmm. Um, if you listen to Joe Rogan, he he talks about this too. But like when you wake up early, you get that workout in, you get that momentum going. You're like, okay, yeah, I'm feeling good now. Now what the what's the next thing? And then you take that next yeah. one, you get that done. You're like, all right, I got I feel a little bit better. Then I get the next thing. And you just keep hitting things, getting through things all day. Um, I think and the the basis of that is just waking up kind of a little bit earlier than you might usually and and getting that quick workout in so um i definitely am a fan of that and i definitely would recommend that to pretty much everybody i mean not pretty much literally everybody <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely i can definitely agree with that as well because I'm, when the gyms were open and whatnot um me and my brother would go to go to work out um like 6 a.m and mm-hmm. like you said it, it get my day started on the right foot. If I can um, tackle um, a challenge of working out, getting a hard workout in, it'll give me, like you said, that momentum right. to go forward and tackle that the next tax, task in the day. And momentum is a force. Momentum is extremely powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's hard to slow down momentum when you get it really going. And like you right. said, that, that workout early in the morning, get you up, get you sweating at the first thing in the morning. And then it kind of makes everything throughout the day a little bit easier to accomplish because you've already got up, you've already, you know, took the day by the horns and really attacked it. So I definitely – I think the other thing with that, not to, like, interrupt you or anything, but I think the other thing too is, like, it literally makes your day longer. Like if you're up earlier, you can accomplish more things in the day. And then mm-hmm. even that if that effect can bleed over into like the next day. So like you wake up, you know, you get good sleep, obviously. So you might have to go to bed a little bit earlier, but regardless, you wake up the next day and you feel that momentum still left over from the day before. And you just get that workout in, you just get killed that day. And then the day's longer so you can get more things done and it's just like a snowball effect like mm-hmm. same kind of thing we talked about or you talked about earlier with like negative thoughts leading to like a negative feeling perception and everything like that you can flip that the other way and roll the ball down the other hill you know what i mean so yeah like just getting that that momentum going is definitely a big key yeah absolutely bro i definitely agree with you on that um so yeah and then after uh that that'll definitely like I said, how physical health ties into your mental health and just creating that positive momentum will do do you great um, benefits uh, mentally. And, you know, even if you're in like some sort of um, rut or in your you're battling with mental health, just try giving out giving um, physical activity a try and see if that'll put you in a better state of being, because if you're doing those things, you're you're actively trying to better yourself you're getting even if you were able to do say 10 push-ups the next day you try and do 15 you're getting better and you know and you recognize that uh progression and progression really lead that's really what helps fulfillment is know, knowing that you're getting better it doesn't even have to be physical activity but just getting better is something that humans really value mm-hmm. um so lastly, um, another way to combat um, poor mental health is to practice mindfulness or meditation on a daily basis. This is something I've um, started doing, and it's helped me a lot just to really ground myself and center myself and really just not think about anything, just, just, to, be, just to be there, just be still. Um, Obviously, it's, I'm sure it's going to be tough for some people, um, but it's just all a process. And like I just said, uh, knowing that you're getting better at something, say I could only meditate for five minutes and then the next day I could do 10. Or if I could only do one and the next day I can do two and the next day I can do three mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Just just being able to progress um, will definitely help you. Um, and just being able to um, meditate and uh and also, I think lastly, I'll, I'll make this the last one, is being, <laughs> gra- being grateful for just practicing gratitude is really going to help your level of happiness. And just because I think a lot of people take what they have for, for granted and, and don't really appreciate the things that they do have, even just being able to wake up with life, um, especially in times like this, when a lot of people are passing, yeah. um, it's good to just 
enjoy the gift of life and knowing that every day is an opportunity to um, make your make a change in your life. So like I said at the beginning, if you're thinking uh, positive thoughts and just thinking from just shifting your paradigm um, to find the good in things and find something to be grateful for, you'll automatically boost your your state of being and boost the mindset that you're in. So, um, yeah, so these are just a few. Obviously, you can um, dive a bit deeper into each one if you would like or find other things that you think would assist you in that. But I mm -hmm. think it's extremely vital, especially um, if you want to be a, and even like other than wanting to be an investor, uh, your health, uh, your mental health is uh, is either more important or just as important as your physical. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think it's definitely important to always monitor how you're feeling. I think a lot of people kind of care too much about what other people or they take care of other people before taking care of themselves. So, but you have to make sure you're all right to even be able to help somebody else. So I think it's extremely, extremely important to be mindful. And especially with um, this being Mental Health Awareness Month, I want to just, you know, shed some light on this topic. And in the next couple, next couple uh, coming episodes, I'll dive a little bit deeper into a couple of the um, things that we covered today. For sure. All right. So I think that about wraps up our fifth episode here. Um, obviously, follow us on all socials. Those will be in the description or the notes. Um, and then we're going to try to get a more consistent schedule, recording schedule going. So with quarantine, it's a little bit challenging because we have to be all remote and everything like that. But um, we'll definitely try to get these out at least we'll say once a week for now. I know we keep saying that, but we're going to, we're going to put our best foot forward and try to get into like a, a weekly recording schedule. So look out for future episodes. Um, we'll post on, I think what will us like LinkedIn tonight. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, basically all, all you'll, you'll find it. If you want to find it, you'll find it. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 